Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to today's podcast. My name is Nasrat Bemiant. I am a holistic mental health coach with 17 years of experience as a psychiatric RN. And this is my uh, business and life partner, Benjamin <laughs> Bruja. And um, he's also my main support person in this journey with implementing metabolic therapies and the ketogenic diet. And we decided to start a podcast just to have conversations from both sides of the perspective, one of being a patient and a psych nurse, but also being a support person for those families uh, who are struggling, who have members of their families who are struggling with their mental health. So we just kind of uh, share our own lived experiences and our own views and perspectives, what has been helpful. And in today's um, topic, we're going to be covering sort of my first year in review of what I've experienced in implementing metabolic therapies and the ketogenic diet. So if you're new here, please feel free to join us, uh, join our community, hit the subscribe button and uh, share this with anyone who would benefit. And without any further, further ado, we're going to go ahead and get started on this. So there's lots of information and sort of the background um, story of how I came to start implementing metabolic therapies in the ketogenic diet and other videos, videos in this channel. But just to give you a little quick snapshot, um, I was diagnosed with, misdiagnosed with depression initially, um, and then prescribed an antidepressant, which I had an adverse reaction to. And then subsequently went, became hypomanic and then was diagnosed with antidepressant induced bipolar disorder. Then more uh, psychiatric drugs were added and I had adverse reaction pretty much to all of the drugs that I was put on. So initially through trial and error, I found things that were helpful. And then I came across the work of Dr. Chris Palmer, Metabolic Mind, uh, Dr. Georgia Ede, and the, these are the keto carnivore community that are exploring sort of the cutting edge metabolic psychiatry, which is a study that explores the connection between diet, metabolism, and mental health, and also physical health, uh, metabolic health. So that's what I've been doing in the past year. I have been able to be off of psychiatric drugs completely. And so, and that meant medically supervised uh, proper tapering, which is really important. So if you're someone who is struggling with your mental health conditions, whether it's depression, bipolar, schizoaffective disorder, or many others, this is definitely something worth exploring and looking into, but it also requires preparation. It requires self-discipline and um, it requires safety in terms of tapering off of the medications as well. So, I want to kind of just share with you my experience so that hopefully it will be uh, something that gives you hope and inspires you maybe to try this for yourself. But definitely, um, it's been a very interesting journey and it's been hopeful and positive in many ways. But there's also lots of challenges that come along with it. And so I don't want to sugarcoat anything. And I want to share with you in this video the highs and the lows and the, you know, rewards and the challenges. So that's kind of what this is about. And All where right. exactly would you like to start? How, how far back do you want to go? Do you want to give a description of, like, let's start right before you decided that, okay, I'm, I want to be off medications and I found keto and this is what I'm going to do. So describe for me, like your state and condition. Yeah. When you made that decision, like you're, you're, you've made the decision, you've stumbled upon keto and you're going to do that. And you're going to come off your medication. So how were you feeling at the time? I would say the biggest thing at the time was this um, cumulative effect of the adverse reactions that became worse and worse over time. Um, brain fog, um, 
fatigue. I was sleeping 12, 13 hours. Like I would come from a day job from working from seven to three and then would crash on my couch for a few hours. And I also had intensifying suicidal ideation. I have gained weight where I'm a small person. So even if it is 10, 15, 20 pounds, I feel it everywhere. So I had, I was probably around 125 pounds at the time. And so over the years, I have really wanted to come off of the drugs because I knew they were causing a lot of issues for me. So there was a lot of, um, I think I had a lot of fear to some extent um, around if I can do this, because when you've been told by psychiatrists or family members and or your physician that you're sick and you're going to need to be dependent on these medications for a long time, probably for the rest of your life, there is definitely some fear associated with it. I also had attempted uh, to come off of, to taper off of some of the drugs that I was on, and I had a really bad experience with that. So there was a lot of hesitation and there was a lot of fear around it. At the same time, the adverse reactions of the drugs and the state of like where I was, was also incredibly uncomfortable um, and challenging. But I think what was hopeful for me at that point, which was about a year and a half ago, previous to that, I had done kind of a foundational work of getting off of birth control pills, which was a huge decision and but the right decision that made a huge difference. I gave up shift work, you know, as an RN, I was working like two 12 hour day shifts, and then two 12 hour night shifts. So I gave that up. And so I was working during the day, I was doing walking a lot, like five to 10 kilometers a day. And then a couple of years prior, I was exploring intermittent fasting. So I was <clears throat> consistently in ketosis. And so all of those things kind of prepared me, but I think what really helped was to come across the carnivore and ketogenic diet communities and to have the information and the knowledge that this is not, this is a therapeutic intervention that was used to treat um, refractory uh, epilepsy for over 100, 100 years with 50% remission rate for one to five years of treatment. So there's a ton of research on this. And, you know, most people, when they think about keto, they think it's a weight loss diet, but there's actually quite a bit of scientific research to show that it's very effective for treating epilepsy, which is a neurochemist, like a neurochemical um, brain disorder. So I felt I did a lot of research and read a lot about these things. And I think that was what gave me the confidence to actually and then I, I think there's a little bit of desperation at that point as well, where you're just like, is this my life? Is this my identity? Is this how it's going to be forever for me to have to put up with drugs that give me terrible side effects? And this is not to say, by the way, for those of you who are on psychiatric drugs or other drugs that are working for you, that are supporting you, that are making a difference, um, there's not a one size fit all approach, but for me, and I think for a certain group of people, psychiatric drugs cause a lot of harm and adverse effects. And I was one of those people. So I really wanted to come off of it and want to feel better. No, and that, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, the next question that kind of comes to my mind uh, mm -hmm. is as, as a professional, right? I, I would be curious to see if you can parse out a little bit for us what it's like if there was any kind of dissonance there for you. It's like, because there's, you know, the desperation of, you know, wanting to get rid of the brain frog and the exhaustion and the other side effects and the dependency on medication. It's like, but you would also been a little bit, you know, inculcated with the disease model in mental health you know, just through your profession. So was there a struggle for you in like, you know, internally about branching away from, you know, what you've been taught in university and what you'd seen practiced for so many years? Yeah, I think that dissonance has been there from the beginning of my career, which grew over time. And I have witnessed so many people 
struggle on medications or get worse sometimes. And I think as time went on in my career, I became disillusioned because I saw so many people continuing to struggle, whether they're on medication or off medication, because the only thing we had to offer them in the mainstream, like conventional psychiatry is drugs and more drugs. I was already questioning that. And I had come to the conclusion that this does not work for everyone. It may work for some people and it, it may work for some people temporarily, but in the long term, it, it does more damage than good. So I had already came to the conclusion that psychiatric drugs can be effective and very helpful in the short term in acute crisis and short term stabilization. But in the long term, many people will experience weight gain, sexual dysfunction, brain fog, cognitive decline. Um, and metabolic issues like prediabetes, high blood pressure, high cholesterol, like all of these things. So I already came to that conclusion. And I also realized that there's a small percentage, a, a percentage of the population that just cannot tolerate psychiatric drugs and has horrible adverse effects to them. And at the time I was actually working in the adolescent and child and adolescent psychiatry in that system. And I saw so many kids and adolescents also put on the same uh, cocktails that adults were put on. And I saw the impact of that. So I had already along the way throughout my career questioned the use of and, and misuse and sometimes most times overuse of psychiatric drugs um, in helping mental health. And I also realized that mental health is a lot more complex than it's just, you know, you have a, a chemical imbalance in your brain, which is a theory. It's actually not a scientific finding. And these are the drugs that are going to fix it. There's so many different factors that impact a person's health. Um, so it's not that simplistic. And so for me, the, the, the distance was there, but not in the direction of like, oh, you know, I, I wanted to find a solution to help myself and to be able to help other people as well, um, to feel better. And so I was more on the side of this doesn't work. I have seen it throughout my career that it, a lot of people continue to suffer and struggle. And I'm also on the same boat as my clients continuing to, to be on medications. And I'm being told that this is a disease that I have, even though I know it was caused and induced by a drug, an adverse reaction to a drug. And then the answer was more drugs. And then the more drugs that I was taking, the, the more adverse reaction that I was experiencing. Well, absolutely. And, and in the work we've done since you've left traditional psychiatry, uh, We've seen, we've seen that story over and over again, right? And it's almost not, not a disservice and it's more, it's more of an artifact of, of, of language. It describing kind of the side effects in the usual terminology doesn't really do them justice. Even, even severe things, you know, like, like, oh, possible increased suicidality. It's like, when you say it that way, it, it almost, you know, if it's not in your living room, you're like, oh, yeah, well, that's bad. But it doesn't have the same, the, the impact. Like, it doesn't paint the picture. And one of the things that we've we've learned recently uh, is that when people do act on increased suicidality and even uh, homicidality, when it comes to medications, uh, the, the intensity and the brutality of those acts is actually greatly increased. It's like the worst outcomes actually happen while people are on the medication. Yeah. And it's not everybody, but that seems to be a, a trend. Yeah, absolutely. And I could go, I could go out into the weeds all day on the medication piece. Cause it's, it's, truly, say it. it's truly, it, 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 it would it blows your mind. Like you even start to scratch the surface of it all. And yeah, it's, it's too much. Uh, yeah. So we're going to try and keep it centered more on, on you today uh, and with metabolic therapies on the positive yeah. side, because that's been really what's uh, been working well for both of us. Yeah. So 
let's talk a little bit about uh, intermittent fasting. Yeah. Because we have a little bit of an oopsie daisy when it comes to fasting. Yeah. This was, that was what, over a little more than a year ago? It was about a little over a year ago, like in August. I, I was actually combining intermittent fasting on its own was okay. I was tolerating that because at the time I was eating a little bit of carbs. But then when we went into carnivore, which by the way, I think carnivore is a fantastic diet. I came across it because I came across Jordan Peterson and Michaela Peterson's story. And so I thought, hey, I'm going to try this because uh, he was able to cure his depression and Michaela cured like a host of um, conditions uh, through the carnivore diet. But for me, when I combined and, and carnivore was a fantastic place to start, like if you're someone who suspects that food is influencing you know, your health and your mental health and your overall health, which it does for many, most people, uh, if not all, then carnivore is the elimination diet and, you know, beef, salt and water, bacon, butter. That was the one that we tried for a few months. But when I combined that with intermittent fasting, what I found was my blood sugar would go really low. The, the good thing about carnivore was it allowed me to really pay attention to the sensitivities that I had, which I was sensitive to dairy and gluten and sugar. Um, and when you reintroduce those foods, usually you'll see your reaction. So I, at the time, I also did the continuous uh, glucose monitor for a couple of weeks, which shows you again, the uh, your reaction to different foods and how your blood sugar goes up and down. Um, so carnivore was simple. It was challenging to eat the same things all the time. Like, you know, if you're somebody who's used to uh, a variety of foods and flavors and herbs and different things, like um, it can be tough. And I also discovered at that point that I had real cravings for you know, bread, uh, pasta, ice cream, like all the other foods that I used to eat, not like, I would say our diet previous to that was okay, it wasn't the worst, and it wasn't the best. But doing carnivore was like, pretty restrictive. And for some people, they swear by it, and they put so many different health conditions into remission that were considered chronic. Um, so I thought, you know what, we'll give it a try. And what I discovered over time, though, is that my blood sugar was getting very low. I had what's something called reactive hypoglycemia, where the one time actually, that's what you're referring to, where my blood sugar was pretty low, I actually ended up having to go to hospital because I lost consciousness. And my blood, um, my blood pressure was too low. My everything was kind of off kilter. So you yeah, really well, have the to, difference. The difference yeah. with you too is that that's in association with your thyroid as well. Yeah, like you you naturally have a little bit like a healthy but on the lower range uh, for blood pressure normally. Yeah, yeah. So it only took like a very very tiny dip. Yeah, to tip it over. Yeah, so that's just to highlight you know for people who are going into this, uh, you know this strategy or this world to really have a good inventory of your own physical health. Like yeah. you, you will need to kind of be very cognizant of anything you've been through previously, anything you're physically diagnosed with. It's always best to, you know, kind of do this in cooperation with your physician, if at all possible. Most of them will think that you're crazy and dismiss you anyways. I say that more because it'd be nice if your doctor would actually be there and support you and be useful for once, maybe. Chances are probably not, but yeah, it is recommended. Yeah, and I was lucky that my physician was very supportive. I got some blood work done. I was also monitoring my weight, my um, blood pressure and blood sugar. Now, so the tracking and medical supervision is important. And you're right, like most clinicians in the conventional system 
physicians, psychiatrists, uh, therapists may not be aware of, you know, carnivore or metabolic psychiatry or a ketogenic diet for mental health. But if you do the best you can to educate them, and, you know, this is supposed to be a collaborative process, there are some clinicians out there more and more that are embracing this and also have lived experience and are teaching and supporting people through this process. But it is definitely not something I would approach lightly. And I would agree, you need to be cognizant of the medications you're on, preconditions that you have, and definitely important to have that support. So I was working with a pharmacist and my family physician who was prescribing the psychiatric drugs that I was taking. So, um, yeah, that piece is really important. And everyone has different sensitivities, different bodies, different brains. So there's no, even when it comes to this, you really have to listen to your own body and the feedback that you're going to be getting moment to moment of how you're feeling, your energy level, and also the raw data, like objective data you're going to have as well from tracking the different things like ketones and blood sugar and blood pressure and weight and all of those things and, and getting proper blood work done as well. So, yeah, so then I decided to kind of ease up on the intermittent fasting because I was starting to lose weight and I added a little bit of carbs and that seemed to really stabilize my sugar actually in the past year I would say I haven't had any <clears throat> incidence of low blood sugar after that after I added the carbs and that was what interested me in the ketogenic diet I came across Dr. Chris Palmer's work metabolic mind which is a nonprofit organization um, that teaches about metabolic therapies and a uh, Dr. Georgia eats information as well. And so I just decided carnivore, I still feel like our diet is a big part of it is carnivore, but we do eat a little bit of carbs as well with the ketogenic diet. And that seems to work quite well. I responded to keto, I would say pretty quickly, like within I would a few weeks, I could tell a difference. One of the biggest things was my energy my energy went up, my sleep that I was used to sleep like 12, 13 hours, I was coming home and I didn't need to take a nap anymore for two or three hours. And initially, there is some danger with the ketogenic diet, by the way, that some people will tip over to hypomania. And so that is one of the challenges that comes with it, or that it might exasperate some of the psychiatric symptoms. And that was a uh, I would say a little bit of a concern because, you know, you just, you know, naturally you do worry about those things. Like you don't want to tip over, but you're also, um, I also started tapering around that time. So I was doing both in conjunction, in conjunction. And the recommended way to go is for the first, you know, six to 12 weeks, you really just want to implement the diet. And once you start implementing the diet, it does change, affect the levels of your medication and how those medications work and how your body works. And so you do need to, you would want to start tapering. And that's what I did. I started tapering the medications. And so I was doing that in conjunction. And that was a pretty scary and precarious time in some ways because, um, you know, there's the fear of, there's the, the withdrawal symptoms as well from tapering off the drugs. Then there's the effect of the, the diet. And then you also worry about, is my illness present? Is it, is this illness? Is this withdrawal? Or is this the effect of the, uh, the diet? Like you, it's really hard to tease things apart at that time. And I think that was really challenging um, yeah. You also start to really access like your own emotions um, more because I think the drugs usually have a sedating and kind of numbing effect. Whereas when you start the keto diet and when you start tapering the medications, then you have access to your full like range of emotions. And that was kind of a terrifying process. Yeah, there could be a bit of a, an emotional whiplash, right? And, and 
I don't know now that we've kind of been doing this for a year. I don't know how much benefit there is on an individual level to try and tease those, those like causal factors apart. Mm. It's like, cause it's indiscernible. It's hard. It's really it's tough like, to. Well, there, there's nobody, there's nobody on earth who can tell you that, oh, this, this particular instance of this negative emotion at this time under these conditions is a withdrawal effect when there's trauma, like when you're removing that kind of blunting effect of medication, it's like, who knows what's there, you know, depending on the person, a lot of it tracks back even to childhood. You know, the reason why they got a medication to begin with oftentimes is some kind of unresolved trauma, right? It's like, so that trauma has kind of snowballed into a, a catalytic event where, you know, they went and saw their doctor and they got a medication because they thought that was the right thing to do. And it's not a wrong decision. Like, it's not a morally objectable thing to do. It's like, but when you remove that, that blunting effect or that sedative effect of the medication, it's like, if you want to call that a withdrawal symptom, Sure. It's more important just to have the right support and tools and strategies to handle intense negative emotion when it comes up, regardless of what you are labeling as causal in the experience. Because who knows? <laughs> you know? Well, I think it was a combination of everything. Like there was, you know, grief and trauma that was coming up that was I was accessing I would say and then there was the effect of the keto diet and and the changes that I was making and then there was also withdrawal so all of those things were present um at the same time I remember at, as I was just getting started on keto I had we had a sort of a family emergency where um a family member was quite um, ill and they had to be hospitalized and went through that process. And it was really very stressful time, um, which I think stress is implicated in mental health and physical health in many ways. But I know that I remember thinking at that time that if it wasn't for keto and having that sort of support, I don't think I would have been as resilient in going through that experience and, and having the mental clarity and the energy and everything that I had to go through that process. Um, I also was experiencing some issues and, and stress at work at the time. And so all of that, I felt like me going through that process of tapering and implementing keto and the metabolic therapies that I did for the previous five, six years kind of came to a head at that point. And I felt like it gave me the strength to really kind of move forward and carry everything through. And then of course, like, you know, and having your support was critical too in that process. Um, and I think that is another thing, like there's, you know, the informal supports that formal supports that you have, like your physician, psychiatrist or therapist, but I think even if you have just one person who is going to be on the same page with you and support you with this, and, you know, if it's your partner or your best friend or a sister or mother, whoever it is, I think that is incredibly invaluable. And I know that was the case for me to have that support. Now, well, it brings up a lot of interesting questions when you're tapering off of medication at the same time, right? Because there's almost always a temptation to they kind of basically be like a psychiatrist and anytime anything, you know, quote unquote negative happens, instead of looking at it as something that is temporary and episodic, it's like, and you can get through, which in our experience is true. It's like, it's not that we don't have bad days or a bad week. It's like, but the temptation is always there to give into the anxiety of, oh, this is illness, you know, because oh, it's, yeah. so, it's so driven into us basically as a marketing campaign if anyone's interested to know where that all comes from it's really really good pharmaceutical marketing it is oh, not huge. it is not medical science it is a, a master class in pharmaceutical marketing and sales that's what it actually is 
it's like but that that temptation to be like well this is you know this is illness this isn't working it's like and then if if this intervention isn't working and that anxiety kind of snowballs it's like you can feel again really desperate really hopeless start to panic think maybe i needed those medications at least i didn't feel like this or whatever the explanation is and i want you to talk about this a little bit because some people will get back on their medication and then they'll have their side effects again they'll be like well i don't want this and then they'll go off the medication on the medication off the medication on the medication and that's kindling right yeah yeah can you talk a little bit about about that not that you've had that experience but no just to keep it yeah i think it's a uh... It's one of the biggest challenges, I think, in this process when you're implementing metabolic therapies, the ketogenic diet, the the mental battle that you go through because of years of conditioning, like I said in the beginning, being told that you are sick, that you have this diagnosis, that it is for life. It's really difficult to... Um, trust your own body's wisdom and trust your emotions and trust your own thoughts and not to pathologize all of your experiences, which, you know, so many people will say, oh, this is my anxiety. This is my OCD. This is my PTSD. This is like, everything can be relegated to a diagnosis. And then you're just this victim that is going through life and you have all these bunch of diagnoses and it's easy to pathologize yourself. So I would say one of the hardest thing that you're going to go through in this process is questioning that um, narrative of mental illness is incurable, it is um, chronic, that you have to be on these medications. And when you keep hearing that from your family and your physician and your psychiatrist, to actually overcome that core belief I would say what has been one of the hardest things in the past year, because there are moments when things are challenging and that's just life. We're not talking about like anything specific per se. We all have different challenges and experiences or overwhelming emotions or grief that comes up or things that happen in our relationship, whatever the case may be. And so not to go back thinking, I need the medications and I need, this must be my illness and my diagnoses and to really look at yourself from a holistic perspective and from a larger perspective of, is my reaction or my emotions or what's going on right now, understandable and reasonable in the context of all of these different factors? And most of the time, the answer is yes. And this idea, a lot of people do reinstate their medications and they come on and off. This happens to, to many people. And that actually has an adverse effect on your brain. It makes your nervous system, your brain more sensitive to changes. People become really sensitive to supplements, foods, um, and generally just their brain kind of has this wear and tear of having to be on and off and with different doses, different drugs. And it's just something that impacts people in a very negative way. And so for me, the past year, I tapered off of the medications. I continued to implement the keto diet. And it wasn't perfect per se. I would say, you know, 90, 95% of the time I'm doing really well and sticking with the diet. I pretty much most of the time eat a, a a small number of foods that, you know, healthy fats, eggs, uh, meat, and some little bit of veggies, not a lot. And I like um, having some great fruits once in a while, but not any, any other fruits. So it's a very um, strict diet. And they say you need to do that maybe one to five years. It just depends on the person. But I, I can't see myself going back to like a standard American or Canadian diet because it works for me and it it is the way that I feel the best so yeah and I yeah. found that like for me because I've done this along with you you know in in solidarity you know I've come along for for the ride on this but it's been really yeah. beneficial for for me as well yeah it's like and I and I lean more 
uh, you know, if we're talking about being, you know, our own personal eroticism, I'm more of an anxious type person. It's yeah. like, so I, I like things simple, inline, ordered, routine. I know yeah. everything that's going on. So I more of maybe a product of my own eroticism is how we've kept kind of our diet so simple. Yeah. Because even though sometimes, and I'll be perfectly honest here, it's gross. Like there's, there's been times where it's like, if I eat one more piece of beef, that's going to be the end of me. I can't yeah. do it. It's like, you have those moments. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. But the most effective way to do it is just keep it really simple. I was going to say, that is one thing I love about keto and carnivore is that it's not a complicated diet. Like it's really very simple. It's very kind of stripped of all these you know, things you have to do. It's it's easy. You don't have to think about it. And I think that's been really nice because I was never somebody who likes grocery shopping or cooking or doing all those things. So it's just to have kind of, you know, exactly what you're eating, what you're buying, and you know what you're making. It's it can, it's not a complicated diet. But in terms of the biggest shift, I would say you're going to have to make if you're considering this as an intervention is you're looking at it as an intervention you're looking at food as medicine as opposed to pills or drugs or medication and so you have to make that mental shift of okay well i have to be really mindful and pick the foods that i'm going to eat because it's going to affect my body and how my brain works and it's an intervention so that is a major shift that you have to make. But yes, sometimes it can be pretty challenging to have to eat the same things over and over. And then I would say the cravings after the first few months um, are not as intense. You will have cravings here and there. But the initial few months, I would say, was like the worst part. But once you get over that, then it kind of lessens. The less you eat those foods that you used to eat, the better it's going to be with time. Yeah, and speaking of tapering, because there's a weird, there's a weird kind of like substrate of this conversation when we get into kind of like the keto and carnivore world, mm. where as much as switching to a ketogenic or a carnivore diet, you know, does have an effect on your, your brain, your body, your energy, all those things. It's like, mm. so did all the other things that you were eating before. It's like, and not just carbohydrates. It's not like you're just not having bread or rice, mm -hmm. it's, you know, it's junk food. You know, it's, for me, it's, it's, it's chips. I love chips. Good salty bag of chips. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And I caffeine. Remember, I, I think you were pretty sensitive to caffeine as well. Yeah. Caffeine. And sugar. Well. Sugar. It's like all these things have a chemical effect as well. And I was shocked at how, how de dependent and how like close to addicted I was to my routine foods. It's like, cause as much as you're going to notice tapering off of a psychiatric medication, tapering off of your old diet is not that different. It's like, yeah. you're going to have cravings. You're yeah. going to feel those, those feelings of dependency. You're probably going to have some increased irritability. It might yeah. affect your sleep. It's like, Oh yeah. Think you need to recontextualize how you see what you put into your body entirely. It's like, and I really notice an effect stopping those foods yeah. as well as the odd time that I've indulged. You know, if it's been three or four months, I've basically been carbohydrate free. Like yeah. I woke up and I've had eggs and bacon for breakfast and I had some kind of beef for lunch and dinner with only salt and a bunch of water and that's it. It's like, and then I break and I have like a muffin. Oof. Yeah. It's like, it's like, it's crack. Like, yeah. like you go loopy. It's like chugging three beer. It's like, yeah. and that, you know, and I bring that up because it was such a, a strange experience for me. Cause this is something that previously I would think has real, no real effect on my body except for, I might, maybe I'll put on weight if I eat like this all the time. Yeah. Not put it, not, you know, drawing a line between the dots of this actually has a really profound effect 
like on my body, my brain, you know, yeah. all the chemicals going on inside of there, like everything. It's like, it gives you a real kind of juxtaposition between how you used to think about food. It's like, and how you need to look at it now and how powerful yeah. it is as an intervention. Oh, it's huge. And you feel that the most, I would say, like when you go through that initial keto adaptation phase where you go from a fat, you know, a glucose burning to fat burning. And so there is lots of symptoms that happen. People almost feel like they have the flu, like you said, irritability, insomnia, you'll have change in your energy, you may have uh, increased anxiety, depression, like, there's lots of changes that happen during that period. It, it absolutely food is like a, a drug like that is the precursor dr georgia Eats says it's the precursor for your brain chemicals and bodily hormones that is where they come from and even your physical body itself that is where it comes from it's the collection of food over time so when you look at food that way it is incredible and also how attached we are to our food to our you know, whether it's our chips or ice cream or bread or whatever it is, we can be pretty attached to that. And it's hard to give that up. Uh, for me, it's always been sweets. It's always, you know, sweet potatoes, ice cream and chocolate, all those things that and bread. I used to love bread, too. But now, like, I, I'm really sensitive to gluten, so I don't crave it as much. But the sweets are hard to give. I remember the first few months just daydreaming about, like, eating ice cream <laughs> well before I remember before we got into all this you know every once in a while there was you know that ice cream shop around the corner from us we'd yeah. stop in for a banana split every once in a while <laughs> and I pass out for like two hours yeah. afterwards yeah yeah and then after a few times, it just becomes this aversion to our therapy. You're like, I know exactly what's going to happen when I have this. I am going to, my afternoon is going to be ruined. And so like, I don't want to go there. Um, yeah, which but is it another, kind of. Yeah. Another, another thing with this too, as, as we've kind of learned through our own experience and through uh, your work with clients is that that mindset shift and that new context for food becomes extremely important if you're tapering off of psychiatric medications. It needs to be very, very firm in your mind that this is now a treatment. Like yeah. this isn't just a fad diet. It's not for weight loss. It's not to help Although you, you will lose weight. Although there will be lots, lots of added benefits. Yeah. It's like... If you are someone, you know, diagnosed with a serious psychiatric condition and you have a psychiatric history and you've been at least somewhat stable on medications and you're removing those medications as a stabilizing element and probably because they do have a myriad of side effects, you now need to view your what you ingest as your diet as the replacement for that treatment. It's like, yeah. it really, really needs to be firm in your mind that if I go off of these medications and I go off of this diet, I'm now untreated. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. That is the commitment that you make. And I think it's worth making just because uh, food as medicine is a lot less riskier and has less adverse effects. If any, I think it has positive effects in many ways, like on your overall health, physical, mental, spiritual, in every way. And it's sustainable. And it is something simple that you can do. So there's lots of positives that have come out of this. Um, but it's such a huge shift in the way you think about yourself, your body, your brain, medications, mental health, in every way. Um, so the past year, I've had kind of an incredible experience in that way I was able to taper off of the psychiatric drugs so I've had a kind of fallen winter where I was on minimal medications last year when I was just doing the end uh, the tail end of my tapering like I was completely off of lithium by last September like a, a little over a year ago and then I had to work with a compound pharmacy to go very slow on my an antidepressant taper 
And so the last um, dose of psychiatric drug I had was like the, the end of December last year. So it'll be a year um, coming up. So it's been pretty um, incredible. And I've made a lot of changes. Um, and, and exercise is another thing I've added in the last little bit. I've always been active for the most part. But I actually started doing strength training the past few months with Ben. And, um, you know, he used to be an athlete, uh, hockey player. So we, we go to the gym every other day, which is really helpful. That's been a huge thing. And um, just going for walks in nature. I love that. Just being in the sun, having light exposure, all of those things contribute. And I would say I was afraid of the um, fall and winter. And I cover that in another video um, because that is, and I did notice a little bit of a shift in my energy in the last few weeks, specifically like October, when the days are getting much shorter. And um, I would say I needed a little bit more sleep. I am focusing on just more self-care and um, a little bit of anxiety. And I think some of it, I would say over the years when I experienced the most sort of challenging, like um, suicidal depressions was around this time. Um, it usually would start in August. And then September, October, November, December would be the worst months until the days start getting longer and longer. And so I had sort of like a natural anxiety around that of thinking like, okay, is this just a kind of my body remembering the trauma of what I have gone through over the years in the wintertime? Or is this, you know, my illness returning back? Or is this, you know, the diet is not working, like you go into, it's, I think, normal and understandable to have those fears. Um, and your first year, like I said, in, in another video, I was saying, your first year feels a little bit of challenging in that sense, because definitely there's that fear. Um, of your illness returning back, your identity in this new sort of um, narrative is established, but you still have, you know, for some many people, <clears throat> they've been taking psychiatric drugs for decades or longer. They've been very unwell. They've experienced the adverse effects. All of that is going to have like an emotional, mental component of fear, like, am I going to be okay and maintain and sustain my wellness? And is this still the right path for me? And I would say 100% that is true. Uh, but these are the things that are going to come up along the way. And I, I want you to be aware of it because a lot of the times people might um, fall back, like you were saying earlier, to either reinstating medication or, um, or you know, just being afraid or stressed around the whole topic, but you have to look at your mental health from many different perspectives and give yourself a certain level of um, leeway to adjust to this process and adjust to the changes that your mind and your brain and your body are making to return to homeostasis and maintain your wellness. Um, so it's been, I would say, overall, a very positive journey and liberating in many ways and having mental clarity and having a new way of looking at mental health from my career perspective. What I do now is very different than what I've done in the past. Um, and it's very fulfilling uh, because it's hopeful. It's a simple intervention strategy that people can implement and, um, but it doesn't mean that it's not challenging along the way and through the process, because you're basically flipping something over in its head, that a narrative that's been told to you many times and still in the conventional system is that's the way it is. And it's from like refraining from diagnosing and medicalizing and uh, pathologizing your like human experience. 
an understandable part of like who you are and totally reasonable in the context of where you're coming from to have those experiences and to be okay and to have different ways of coping with them to help you move forward. Yeah, and, and you know, medication is a, it's a physiological treatment and that's, that's the same plane that uh, the ketogenic and carnivore diets operate on. It's like, so you're trading a low, a, comparatively an extremely low risk treatment with yeah. an extremely high risk treatment. It's like the worst, the worst thing that happens if like the ketogenic diet doesn't work for somebody, uh, you don't have to do it anymore. It's like, you just stop and you explore other areas. It's like, and there's a myriad of, you know, treatments and modalities and medications and psychotherapies and, and everything under the sun. And you never know exactly what's going to work for each person. It's usually a combination uh, of different things that really helps, you know, a person start to, you know, recover and feel better on a consistent basis. But for people who are tapering uh, and going on the ketogenic diet as an alternative, mm. I, I've always thought, this is a throwback from, from my hockey days, but it's, it's the worst hits are the ones that you don't see coming. You got your head down and you don't see it coming. Those are brutal. That's when you get injured. You know, that that's the one that, you know, takes you out of the game. Mm -hmm. You can take a big hit if you see it coming. Even if you only have, you know, a split second to brace yourself and kind of get in a better position and absorb it a little bit. It still sucks. Don't get me wrong. It's awful. You never want it to happen. It's like, yeah. but, you, but you get through it, you keep playing. So these types of conversations are kind of my idea of that principle. It's like, you know, if there's been a pattern, like, you know, you had a bipolar depression and, you know, around fall going into winter is when previously you would get really depressed. Yeah. It's like, yeah, it's like, it's normal to have an anxiety about that. It's like your, your brain operates on pattern recognition. It's like, so yeah. don't get anxious about your anxiety. It's like be like, oh, yeah. it's that, <laughs> oh no, that actually makes perfect sense that I would be getting, I would get anxious about this around this time of year. That's a pattern I've had before. Yeah. It's like it seems simple, but finding different ways to manage and regulate th that type of peripheral experience around, like the new keto treatment as well as the the drug tapering. Yeah can be extremely beneficial. It's like, so by peripheral, I mean things like that. It's like, you know, a good example is like a, the fear of fear itself is an example of like a peripheral emotional experience. It's like having anxiety about your anxiety because you might get anxious because, you know, you get anxious around this time of year. It's like, you can actually oh, yeah. just have the anxiety about, oh, this is a pattern I've been through before and yeah. I'm going to feel a little bit anxious during this time which is normal for me. It's like, and I have, you know, support, I have different skills, I have different tools, or I can seek support. But just to go, oh, yeah, you know what, actually makes sense. Makes sense that I would, you know, have an uptick of negative emotion right now. It's like, and just keeping yeah. that, you know, that keeps it from snowballing. It's, yeah. like, it's one of the things that I've noticed. It's like, you know, with me, with you, and I think with most people, mm. It's like there's there's that catalytic moment where the ball starts rolling a little bit. And if yeah. you can slow the momentum down early, you know, then you can stop the snowball from getting out of control. So it's not yeah. it's not that that ball won't start rolling, that you won't have a little bit of negative emotion, you know, whether that's a little bit of a depression or a little bit of anxiety during a certain time of year or around a certain event. It's just to not not let it get out of control. Yeah, and I had that experience early August, which was the times that I usually would get sick. And so, and then I had to, I had a couple of weeks where I think it was the anxiety of like expecting something bad is going to happen. And it was the same thing to some extent. And um, in the past few weeks where I felt a little bit shift in my energy and different kind of areas, 
but I actually feel much better now because I also recognize that um, that the anxiety about what could happen or how that would impact me, I think had more to do with it than the actual physiological changes that were happening. So um, that's another thing, you know, like you learn to manage your thoughts and emotions. And like I said, not pathologize them, but understand them from many different perspectives. So to me, compared to many other years that I've gone through when I was on medication and when I was um, having adverse effects, this is totally uh, like more manageable and mild than what I've experienced, like drastic states of consciousness and suicidal ideation and debilitating symptoms in the past. So I'm also just basically telling myself, this is the first year where so many changes have happened with my body, with my health, with tapering. And some people will experience kind of delayed reaction with withdrawal, withdrawal symptoms. So all of those things are possible or a combination of them. So just trying to kind of navigate and keep um, going through this process and um, kind of just accept things um, more where they're at and double down on all of the self-care things that I do, whether if I need a little bit more sleep, that's okay. If I need to exercise more or have some more sunlight or stick to the diet, like everything else. So you just, there's many, many different things that you can do to help yourself. But I would say looking back <clears throat> over the past year, um, it's one of the best things that I did. And it's been mostly incredibly positive experience to implement the metabolic therapies and the ketogenic diet and to be in this place. Like I had really wanted this for many, many years because I had adverse reaction from day one with psychiatric drugs. Um, I was just one of those people who could not tolerate um, the psych drugs. So I didn't think it was possible for me to be here where I'm at today. And I would say it is so much better than what has happened in the 13 years that I was on psych drugs, uh, personally for me. Um, and so yes, there's like some ups and downs and challenges that come with implementing therapies like the ketogenic diet and metabolic therapies. But the rewards, I would say, far outweigh the challenges that come with it. And most of it, I would I would say, is the mental, emotional of letting go of the narrative of what you've been told about mental illness, what you've been told about um, medication, and learning to really trust your own, the body's wisdom and your intuition, and trusting in um, being able to achieve health and wellness and maintaining your balance to move forward in your life. And I think that's the big shift. That's a big mental, emotional shift that you make in this process. No, absolutely. And and for people who are really, you know, really ready to kind of take the journey, as much as I dislike how everything these days is a journey, uh, I need to find a better word. It's like at that moment when you're ready to make the decision to really prioritize, you know, your health and your recovery and, and trying to have the best quality of life you can for whatever time any of us have left. It's like, cause that's really the question you're asking yourself, you know, a year ago, it's like, Hey, I might have, who knows how many years left. It's like, could, could be 10, could be 50, could be six months. It's mm -hmm. like, I don't know. It's like, but going forward, what kind of life do I want to have? Mm -hmm. You know, it's like, and that's the real question. It's like, so when you're doing a risk analysis of like, well, this could be pretty risky. And that's how I felt when we started all this. Like I was, I was hyper vigilant, paranoid, like this could be a disaster on cataclysmic levels. I have no idea how this is going to work. It's like, but we, we got together and we kind of looked at it and basically pulled the trigger. We're like, are we going to? Is this what we're going to do? And by us, I mean, you were like, hey, I'm going to do this. And I'm like, okay, well, I guess we're going to do this. I I actually want to do the reverse interview for this. Oh, I, I want to interview you and see like what your process was throughout 
uh, the year, the past year, because yeah. this is my perspective. So this would be a really cool thing to do for someone who is supporting another person in that process. Let's do that. Let's do that next. Give you the, the tips and tricks. Yeah. As a support person, what goes through your mind and what you go through and what uh, helpful um, support that you can provide for people. So I think we're kind of nearing the hour mark. And I would like to end it here, but I want to do the next podcast where we talk about what the journey was like for you as a support person. Oh, put me in uh, the hot seat. Yeah, you're going to be in the hot seat. Oh, uh, you can do that. Okay. Um, so I hope this was helpful for you today. And um, so if you have any questions, comments, please uh, share down below and pass this uh, video to anyone you believe would benefit. And if you need additional support, reach out. And um, I thank you for watching this video. And um, I also have a link to our website where you can subscribe to our weekly newsletter where we share strategies and tips um, on how to implement keto and how to go through this, this journey and this process. So if you like it, it's the mentalhealthreset.org. So click on the link below and uh, you'll be kind of guided to subscribe. All right. Thank you so much for watching this. And we will see you in the next episode where we're going to take it from the caregiver sort of like support person perspective and how you support that person as they go through this process. All right. Thanks so much. Bye for now.